Thank you for joining us, Dave. You know, you didn't grow up in a very, uh, I guess, traditional horsey background. Tell us about how you grew up and eventually got into the farrier industry. And uh, I was born in 1954 in a southeastern Ohio coal mining community. And in uh, 1959, my father bought me a pony. It was, uh, it was a retired mine pony. I actually pulled the carts in the coal mines. So uh, in 1959, I, I went on my horse adventure. And uh, from 1959 until the early 60s, I was absolutely captivated by the farrier that used to trim and would come to our area on occasion. And uh, in the early 60s, I, I met a, uh, another fellow farrier and horse enthusiast in the area named Fritz Bookman, who was, uh, became my mentor, still my mentor. And he was gracious enough to let me ride around with him. So through the 60s, I spent my childhood in Southern Ohio and went to school, and, uh, but I knew I needed to, to get out and go other places. That's how I got my start. And then where did you go from that point and, I guess, further develop within the trade? Well, I, I was so intrigued with, uh, with people that would visit our area from other areas of the country to go trail riding. We had a lot of uh, national parks, state-owned property there that was a big trail riding community. And I, I seen the, the type of horses and uh, uh, people with... Uh, with better income and uh, the, the shoeing obviously was a better quality and I just wanted to get out of that area. Uh, the coal mining uh, wasn't a very good way to make a living and my father and mother moved to northern Ohio where my father got a factory job. So of course I tagged along with that and uh, immediately tied in with uh, a local riding stable called Hannum's Riding Stables in Kent, Ohio and uh, tied right in there with all their hack horses and sharpened my skills, I guess I would say, on trail horses in the early, early 70s. What was it about farriery that drew you in and made you want to join the industry? You know, uh, some people are intrigued with firemen and, uh, and doctors. Or uh, The first time I saw a farrier work was a, was a blacksmith who did some horseshoeing, but in a, an actual uh, little shop where he sharpened mining tools and, and I was so amazed by that. I was mesmerized like a fire and uh, I, I just couldn't get enough of it. I would watch him and stop on my way to or from this riding, trail riding place where I went. And then of course once I met Fritz Bookman he had a real truck and real equipment and, uh, and he was so gracious to take me with him one time and I was immediately attracted to it. I knew from the time I I first seen it that it was that was going to be my life. It was going to be my ticket to, uh, to a better life. Mentorships have been an incredible part of your career. Can you talk about that a little bit? And also, and it may be surprising to some people, you're more than willing to pass it along and regularly invite people to come join you in Florida, or Ohio, wherever you're shooing. Well, because of the people that, that I was surrounded by at that young age who were open and, and shared with me uh, through Mr. Bookman uh, and, and then on to, to Frank McGinnis, uh, one of the things that Frank McGinnis told me when I met him in the early 70s was, I'll show you everything I know if you'll promise to pass it on. That was Frank McGinnis's gift to the world was, you have to pass that on, give it to somebody else. People especially farriers, should not have to make the mistakes of the old, the old ways, where people thought you need to go through certain things, you need to suffer, horses need to, to teach you. Uh, Frank's whole, whole life was based on teaching, showing everybody everything. And Frank told me, it was very impressionable, you can share everything you know with anyone, they'll never catch you, you're still ahead of them if you're still learning and still thinking. So immediately, I was, I was a, a very young man, teenager, early 20s, I, that was instilled in me because I wanted to help somebody else. I was taught if I help somebody else, I learn more also. So I continue to do that. I love young people. I love their enthusiasm. 
Uh, I love the fact that I can help that person achieve his goals faster. And it's never hurt me, it's never hurt my business. I've been blessed to meet young people that, uh, that have the energy that I have, positive attitude. Energy and enthusiasm are, are incredibly important, but what are some of the other traits that you'd recommend younger farriers acquire? Well, I think the best thing you can do is get a, a solid foundation. Uh, we have wonderful horseshoeing schools in the United States that will give you the basics. That's your kindergarten. But latch on to somebody like Red Wrenchin or James Gilchrist or, or uh, Mike Wharton or Roy Bloom. That is your best way to achieve your goals. Uh, find somebody that has what you would like to have in, in life. Find someone that's already achieved what you want what your goals are and and they will help you get there the fastest the easiest even though i had i was i was fortunate enough to receive a lot of things when you're young you still think you have a better way and you're smarter than that person so i made many many mistakes uh, some of the mistakes was just not staying in one discipline probably but as I would I, I don't want to think or anyone to think that I was any better than anyone else or I'm certainly not as good a farrier as others but when you when you reach a peak with a discipline uh, I had a shop a standard bread shop in in my hometown at Coshocton uh, once I had all of the horses that were there the only way for me to excel any better was go to other places or to better tracks and I think one of the biggest mistakes I made was not being happy and satisfied with that. Uh, many, many, many mistakes, many, many mistakes, very, very small mistakes, but that's probably the most important ones. I just didn't, didn't, didn't stay with that. However, it led on to other things such as the, the quarter horses. I got into the quarter horses. I have family in, in the racehorse business. Uh, I, I was making good money with the thoroughbreds once I got out of the stand of breads and I followed I followed uh, people to the thoroughbred tracks where again you're you're working harder you're doing more and uh, found out the negative side of collecting money from some people uh, second biggest mistake was not learning early enough how to manage your business and how to be a better business person in collecting your money so those are probably the two most important things. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to have skills to do those. You don't have to be a great farrier to learn to be happy with where you're at and, and to be consistent and stay in one discipline. And you don't have to be a skilled farrier to learn how to collect money. Uh, there's so much more to horseshoeing than just shoeing on, on horses, just nailing on shoes. I think the third biggest mistake was not learning that earlier. I thought the way to success was through a fire and an anvil. And uh, we have a new generation of farriers coming on now that are, that are learning from my mistakes and they're, they're learning the business side of it S through the help of, of the farrier industry and, and the farrier's journal. There's so much to learn about shoeing horses. So if, if anyone can learn from some of those mistakes, I think we would be fortunate to take those shortcuts. What was it that compelled you to change from shoeing the standard breads and to go into those other disciplines? I loved it. I, there's not been a discipline that I've done that I didn't love. I, I don't necessarily think there was anything that turned me off. Uh, I had a family and the family was growing. I. I exceeded the money that I could charge at that level, at that discipline I was doing. At the, at the track, at my little shop that I had, there's only a certain amount of horses, only a certain amount of stalls, one shop. I was blessed to be there. I love the people, but I couldn't go any farther. And uh, when your family grows from one to two, three, four, five, I have five of the best kids in the world. It takes a lot of logs to keep that fire going. But I loved it. I loved it. The standard bread shoeing taught me so much. The, the, the people like Dr. Steele from New York, who is now into the hunter-jumper industry, 
Dr. Gobble at Ohio State who wrote books about shoeing that this industry has never seen. Uh, amazing people. That's the reason why I changed. I like challenge. Uh, I like meeting farriers that, that are in this industry that have excelled. Uh, I've, I, I want people to practice what I preach because I practice what I preach. I seek out those farriers who have greater knowledge and I'm a sponge when I'm around them. So when you meet people that excel in the, in the other disciplines, you can't help but just feel uh, a huge attraction to them. You want to mimic what they're doing and learn what they're doing and you want to learn how to help a confirmationally challenged horse be able to pee off easy. Uh, the challenge of it is what, what kept me moving from discipline to discipline. I am nothing but a huge, huge accumulation of everybody else. Maybe I have a, a, a desire, a, a little more desire, maybe I'm a little bit more positive, but it's so easy to learn by, by osmosis and, and absorption. It's so easy to get things from them. And that's it. That's the big secret to my success is just surrounding myself with people that were better than me. Standard bred shoers have earned that reputation as problem solvers. So how do you still see that translate to your work today? You know, every day I, I see things that I did with the standard breads come out in my work every day. For me, what helped with standard breads was, of course, being around those people that were there, but um, Dr. Gobble was very interested in gates, and uh, he made a comment to me one time that standard bread shoeing should be the easiest discipline to learn because you're only focusing on one gate. So forget the walk to the track and forget any galloping because we don't do that. Think one gate. And from that moment on, I was able, it, it, it almost made it slow motion to me. So you understand confirmation. And confirmation is confirmation on any horse. When you study a standard bred horse and their confirmation and the challenges that they have, and all horses have challenges, it, it, it really comes into focus very simple. So looking at that horse that, that has its knees rotated out, cannon bones are twisted and then the toes are in, you know where he's going to break over. It slows down. Likewise, you see that when that carries over into the quarter horses, or the thoroughbreds, and, and, this, and the bigger horses. It's just bigger stock. I think the standard breads taught me confirmation so quick when I slowed it down and focused on the one gate, when you forget about everything else. And horses that, that go on to lope or canter and other disciplines are just accelerating speed. So if you, if you understand that gait, that trotter pace, and you, and you transfer that into the larger horses and understand the confirmation, it all just works. So it, it's applied, and I think it'll be applied forever. I think that carries on into every other discipline. And I wish more people could appreciate the standard bread industry. And, I, and I, I'm saddened that, that it consumes us. Even when I was on the track and I had my little shop, your whole life was on that track and uh, it was daylight till dark and, and you didn't know the rest of the world was around you. I think it still happens today that we have wonderful farriers shoeing standard bred horses that I wish we could get to and learn from them. Would you then recommend, regardless of whatever your discipline, if you're starting out or early in your career, you try to go find that standard bred shoer and oh. work with them? Highly recommend it. I think it's, it's grossly overlooked in, in, in the entire United States and possibly the world because they're in a fixed location. They're always around a, a huge population area. Uh, they're right there. You, if you can get the, this person to allow you to come in, you know you're going to be there at a certain time. You know he's going to do a horse every hour, all day long. And you can focus. You can focus on what this man's doing. And it's easy to watch him in the forge. He's always got an area that's designated chewing area, designated forge area. Wonderful learning experience. I, I wish that people would capitalize on it more.